Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. Let's get to what we're here for. Robert Shear has been taking us to school here at All Saints for more than 40 years, maybe. We're not quite sure when it all began. Um, we like to bestow titles on people here, and what should we call him? Truth digger in residence, provocateur in residence. For many of us, Bob has been at the center of our political education since he was the Vietnam correspondent, managing editor, and editor-in-chief of the late, great Ramparts magazine in the 60s. I remember getting my hands on a Ramparts in ninth grade. It was like it was going around the bus like a Playboy magazine. It was so exciting. We'd, <laughs> none of us had ever heard any of these ideas before, and we were shocked, and whole worlds were opening up before us. Uh, from 1976 to 93, he was a national correspondent for the LA Times, and in 1993, launched a nationally syndicated column at the Times and was named a contributing editor. In 2005, he moved that column to the website TruthDig, where he is editor-in-chief and where you can find his column, as well as, as those of Chris Hedges and Juan Cole, both great friends of ours, and all the news that you won't find in the corporate media or the Sunday morning talk shows. Uh, Bob is also a contributing editor for The Nation, as well as a Nation Fellow, and you can hear him on Left, Right, and Center on KCRW and on the podcast. He's written nine books and is currently a clinical professor of communications at USC's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. When the NSA story became headlines a few weeks back, we knew who we needed to hear from to make sure that we kept our eyes on the real story and didn't get distracted by the media circus. Please join me in welcoming truth teller, provocateur, and great friend of all saints, Robert Shear. <laughs> this is my wife, and she's telling me my hair is wrong. <laughs> But it's a great victory to get her here because she was raised Catholic and still has her own prejudices. Um, so, well, well, let's see if we can bring her into the fold. Uh, as I understand, I'm a summer uh, replacement, uh, and uh, Ed Bacon is uh, in New York. And uh, I don't mind speaking a little bit about religion uh, today in relation to this whistleblower uh, issue. I think it's quite relevant. I actually do teach an ethics uh, course at USC, and uh, uh, people are surprised that I bring in, uh, particularly Jesus, on occasion. Uh, I did on um, our last Left, Right, and Center show talking about the Good Samaritan and the viciousness towards uh, the poor uh, that has been exhibited, particularly around the food stamp issue, and I got hate mail over it. You know, why, why are you bringing up Jesus? Well, you know, it's pretty, a lot of enlightenment in that quarter. And it relates to our, our issue today, I think. Uh, I want to jump right in because I know one of the great commandments here is that we have to end at 11, right? And this is a, a fairly complex uh, subject. So let me, uh, you know, without all the jokes and everything, start. Um, and I remember uh, uh, <clears throat> reading, you know, with uh, Kennedy and um, uh, with uh, Reagan in particular when I interviewed him, uh, a reference to a city upon a hill. And I never quite th th thought much about it or figured it out until recently. And actually, it's, it's a really important concept. I always thought it was an invitation to imperialism and jingoism, you know, uh, we're somehow special. Uh, yeah, we're special in that we're being observed. We're special in that we're being judged. We're special in that we have claimed to be the center of freedom in the world. We have, we're special in that we claim to be the world's greatest experiment in democracy. The city on the hill actually is taking over from ideas that we're the new uh, Athens, that we're, we're the place that knows how to do this. And um, it was interesting, so I went back, uh, you know, because I knew I was going to fill in Fred Bacon, and I read Matthew 5.14, uh, <laughs> the parable of salt and light in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and quote, uh, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And that's the key thing. It, we, we, what we do is observed by the whole world. And so if we attack the truth seeker, the whistleblower, if we punish them, if we hound them, it's being observed. And it's being observed. There's an amazing thing this morning that Hong Kong, under the power of Chinese communism, 
somehow has a more open attitude uh, and did not just turn uh, Edward Snowden over to the U.S. And I don't know, I was up half the night following uh, this news, but I found it quite thrilling. Uh, he's on the lam, uh, you know, and uh, WikiLeaks is supporting him, and uh, he's getting support around the world because people are wondering, well, you, you, you people claim to be interested in freedom and democracy. You've always given refuge to dissidents, people who oppose power. And here's a guy who's opposed power and said, hey, the government's spying on people, you know, getting their form, and not just in the United States, spying on the leader of Russia, spying on the Chinese, uh, spying on private citizens all over the world, feel that right uh, not only to get their information, but then even have the right to arrest them, send them off to some totalitarian country to be tortured, and you have to really wonder what's been happening uh, to this country. What is it all about? Instead of being this refuge, when Reagan uh, quoted a city upon the hill, he actually, I was amazed, he actually made a very broad, opening, welcoming statement about immigration, about being open to the world, about being a center of liberty in the world. And here we are uh, hounding uh, people around the world who dare to challenge our monopoly on information. And when I wondered about how did this happen, uh, how did we get into this pass? I went back and I read uh, something that I've referred to in a previous book, uh, one of my favorite documents from the American legacy, George Washington's farewell address. And in George Washington's farewell address, he had, he, it's a really important document. He had about eight years to, to work on it because he wasn't going to have a second term, but he had already written it four years before. He consulted with Madison and others, Jefferson, uh, uh, on the content of it. And it's a very important statement for those of you who haven't read it. You can go read it uh, after church. That's your assignment. And, and uh, what it is is basically explaining what the whole American experiment is all about. And what it's about is not becoming an empire and not having the problems of Europe and not following the example of Europe because they knew a lot about Europe and they knew what had happened to Rome, what had happened to Spain, what had happened to England. They knew that when you build an empire, you lose any claim to really caring and dealing with your own people. That an empire and a republic are a contradiction. You cannot have both. If you're going to have a republic, a representative republic of free citizens, you cannot be conquering the world or expanding your influence or meddling in everyone's business. Because as we all know from the war, truth is the first casualty. We know that you're not always going to be on the right side. We know you're being pushing around and so forth. And so I just want to quote one thing that, that Washington said in his farewell address. He said, I ask, I come here, quote, to warn against the mischiefs of foreign intrigue, to guard against the postures of pretended patriotism. To guard against the postures of, this is from our general. You know, just like the other great general who warned us about the military-industrial complex, Dwight Eisenhower. These guys knew war. They knew danger. No people have ever been in greater danger to their nation than our founders. They come up with an idea of a nation, and it wasn't just the uh, uh, crown in England that wanted to destroy them. They were certainly in a position of great insecurity, and when they gave us the Fourth Amendment guaranteeing our right to be in our home as a castle, free with our thoughts, our papers, and ideas, uh, not to be intruded upon, to have that private space to stand against the king or any ruler, they weren't doing it. You know, we have a lot of talk now, well, that's all very well and good, but that was before 9-11. You know, somehow that changed everything. Well, no, the founders of this country faced risk far greater than the ones we face now. We are the strongest military power that's ever existed in the world. We have tremendous resources. We have no difficulty defending ourselves from foreign enemies, demons, or what have you. The founders of this nation were at great risk. Any day, any week, things could have gone south. And they could have been hanging from some tree. And their family destroyed, their land seized. These people were living at a time of great risk when they wrote our Constitution. And they enshrined this notion of limited government and the power of the individual because they didn't think freedom was a luxury. They thought it was a necessity to good governance. They didn't think the protection of the individual, the privacy, the rights of the individual, the rights to free speech, 
the right to be secure in your home. They didn't think this is something you do when you have no problems. This is something they enshrined when they had big problems of security. And the assumption was that a free people will be more secure. They will challenge the mischief of government and the impostures of pretended patriotism and the foreign entanglements and all the other things the founders won. So we didn't think of freedom as a luxury. They thought of it as a necessity to governance and to the existence of a free republic. And that's what's enshrined in what this country is all about. Yet after 9-11, and I've argued this extensively, uh, our military-industrial complex lost its communist enemy, and suddenly it had terrorism. And you can do anything. And the same people who we pay to protect us against terrorism, the Booz Allens of this world, Booz Allen Hamilton, are also the people who can specialize in threat inflation. You know, the enemy is everywhere. The wonderful thing about the war on terror is it's the gift that never stops giving. There's always going to be terrorism. There's always going to be an enemy. It can't be negotiated with. As long as it's an imperfect world, there are going to be people who do bad things. And so as a justification for a militarized society, uh, they are ready to go. And that, out of that comes the whole notion of the permanent national security state, the surveillance state. You have the right to intrude, uh, just shred our Constitution, certainly shred the Fourth Amendment, the right to intrude on every aspect of our lives. Now, one of the good things that's happened is that in our modern networked world, we have a group of people who actually are free thinkers. Startling. You know, whether they're called libertarians or whatever they are, cultural anarchists, or, I'm sure you know some of them here in, in Pasadena. I just, uh, our Truth Dig site was awarded uh, its fifth Webby uh, in New York. That's the, for the best political site on the internet. And so we go back there. And, uh, you know, I'm in a room with, with uh, you know, a thousand people who are basically doing a lot of the exciting stuff on the Internet. And they don't like the surveillance state. They think it threatens the vitality of this uh, uh, new Internet world. It threatens people's security. Uh, I was even sitting next to the guy who just sold Tumblr. It's just sold Tumblr for $1.2 billion. And I asked him, I said, aren't you concerned that what Yahoo really wants is everyone's private data? You know, he said, Yes. Of course he's concerned, and he's going to fight against et cetera, et cetera. And the whole mood, when, when people talked about individual freedom, uh, when they talked about defending individual freedom, that got the biggest applause lines. So one reason our government is in trouble, it's dependent upon a lot of smart people who also believe in freedom. And some of them are willing to become whistleblowers. Some of them are willing to say careerism is not the end. There are values. There are things to care about. And indeed, it's so interesting in this whole debate, we who raised this standard for the world at, in the Nuremberg trials, does anybody even remember that? You know, the Nuremberg trials, where there actually had been a discussion with Roosevelt and Churchill and Stalin about just killing the whole German officer class. They'd engaged in criminal activity. And Roosevelt is even supposed to have cracked the joke. No, let's just kill, uh, uh, <clears throat> Churchill wanted to kill 100,000. No, let's just kill 49,000. Uh, but they weren't joking when they said uh, that we're going to hold these people accountable. You know, that's what the whole point was. And people were convicted. And they were convicted in the defense. The key thing that came out of Nuremberg was you cannot make the defense that you were following orders. You have individual responsibility. Not something I should have to stress in a Protestant church. You are personally accountable. Okay? That was the principle. And for those who've forgotten what that principle is, which is in most of our media, uh, you know, let me quote what is generally regarded as principle four of the Nuremberg. And this was actually enshrined in a UN document and so forth. Quote, the fact that a person acted pursuant to order of his government or of a superior does not relieve him from responsibility under international law provided a moral choice was in fact possible to him. Okay? Want me to repeat it? The fact that a person acted pursuant to order of his government or of a superior does not relieve him from responsibility under international law, provided a moral choice was, in fact, possible to him. 
Now, if you're Edward Snowden and you come into, or, or Bradley Manning, and you see this information, somebody told me before, oh, people uh, even in this church are arguing about this at breakfast table, breaking up family. I don't get it. I don't get it. We have a clearly established principle that if you think crimes have been conducted in your name by your government, you know, the killing of innocents in Iraq, which was what motivated Bradley Manning, or intruding on people's privacy and manipulating them, that you have an obligation to speak up. You have an obligation uh, to express that. And if you feel the channels are blocked, and they certainly are in connection with the National Security Agency, there are no channels for an individual to speak up, then you have an obligation to become a whistleblower. That's not some foreign notion. That's something that came out of our tradition. That's our law. We held people accountable. And you can't just duck it. So I, I just want to throw that out first. And then I want to talk something. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about my own experience and why I feel so strong about this. Uh, the other day, I, I, yesterday actually, Ron Kovic, you may know Ron Kovic, the movie Born on the Fourth of July, a uh, guy who's paralyzed from here on down, yet he's great, he's out there, he's a peace warrior. And he happened to call me yesterday and he asked me what I was doing. I said, I'm going to All Saints, All Saints Church. You know, he says, oh, I love that place. <laughs> and he, said, he told me, he said, you know, uh, when he first came out against the Vietnam War, this was one of the places where he spoke. And, uh, and, and he said he was so grateful to this church because he was being criticized. Are you abandoning your own legacy and the troops? And, and, uh, and he said that he found a home here. And I thought about my own relation to whistleblowers. Why was he wounded in Vietnam? Why was he sent there as a young, idealistic American, joined the Marines, and did two tours in Vietnam before he was paralyzed for the rest of his life? Because we didn't have whistleblowers. You know, the first real big whistleblower we had was Daniel Ellsberg, who was slapped with the exact same charges that they're leveling now against Edward Snowden. Exact same charges, violation of the uh, Espionage Act. Uh, and yet, what was Ed Daniel Ellsberg's crime? I remember this very vividly because, first of all, I had gone to Vietnam the first time in 1964, 63, 64. I went against 65. And I went there the first time because I was trying to figure out how we did this. Why are we in Vietnam? It's so very early on. And I found documents. Somebody had died, and his widow had donated his papers to the University of California. She wasn't supposed to do it. They were secret. And it was all about the Michigan State CIA project to basically subvert the Geneva Agreement on what would happen in Vietnam. The French had a negotiated agreement. There was supposed to be an election in 1956, two years after signing it. It was clear. And the problem was, as Eisenhower pointed out in his memoir, uh, that 80% of the people would have voted for Ho Chi Minh. So some geniuses in our government figured out, let's subvert that whole process in the name of freedom. OK? We'll bring freedom to them by preventing them from having a fair election. And they had the Michigan State CIA project. And I found out about this totally by accident because this widow had donated the papers. And there it was in the stack at UC Berkeley. And I got it, blew the dust off, and there it was. Some of our finest intellectuals, some of the best and the brightest, had gone along with a scheme. Michigan State had a police academy, and they brought in CIA people to train people uh, in Vietnam, very much like what happened in Iran with Kermit Roosevelt and the overthrow of Mossadegh and so forth. And we, were gonna, we found <clears throat> uh, you know, our leader, our George Washington, he was in a seminary in New Jersey, no uh, Jam, and we put in power, and the whole thing was all laid out. None of those people ever talked about it. 3.5 million people, by McNamara's estimate, died in Indochina because of this war. 3.5 million. In the movie Fog of War, McNamara says he could have been judged a war criminal. He said he could not find any justification for the war. He cannot defend it. 
Why weren't there whistleblowers? The first whistleblower I found was a guy you may know. He lives on the west side of L.A., Stanley Scheinbaum. Stanley K. Scheinbaum, very well known because he was the guy who fired Daryl Gates when he was the police commissioner. Uh, but Stanley K. Scheinbaum was, believe it or not, the co-director of the Michigan State CIA project. And I interviewed him. That's how I met him. And I began a lifelong, my first whistleblower. And Stanley K. Scheinbaum broke his oath. And when I had all this information and no one else would talk about it, Stanley Scheinbaum said, yes, it's terrible. It's awful. You've got it right. And I'll speak out. And he did. The next per time I, I recognized a whistleblower connection with Stanley was when Ellsberg told us the story of, of the Pentagon Papers. And he wasn't, you know, now we think, oh, well, Ellsberg was different than Bradley Manning. No. Ellsberg actually was dealing with secrets that were more significant than Bradley Manning. Uh, he had a higher level of security. He was working at the Rand Corporation. And at that time, he wasn't getting much support. And Stanley Scheinbaum, my whistleblower, uh, consistent to his lesson, organized the main fundraising for Els Ellsberg's defense. Stanley K. Scheinbaum. Okay, and as a result, Ellsberg was able to get a good legal team going, and then when Nixon screwed up by trying to corrupt the judge, uh, he, the tr they never really resolved the issues of the trial. They had a mistrial. The other case I had in relation to whistleblowers in relation to Vietnam, I happened to be in Vietnam at the time, around the time of the Gulf of Tonkin. And I actually believed that there had been a Gulf of Tonkin attack, the second attack. And that was the justification. They think it was valid, but that was the justification for extending the war to the north and really causing the whole Vietnam War. It was Fulbright's resolution, which is the closest we had to a declaration of war. And Senator Fulbright uh, said later it was the thing he was most ashamed of his life because the government lied to him. Now, I have always been against conspiracy theories because I've always thought, you're not going to get a lot of people to lie, okay? And then, but it turns out in the Gulf of Tonkin, as an example I use, uh, I remember I got these papers when they, they were declassified, I was able to get them. 20 years after the fact, there was no Gulf of Tonkin attack. The whole U.S. Congress was lied to. And hundreds of people knew. One of them was Admiral Stocksdale, who ran as Ross Perot's vice presidential candidate. He was shot down over Vietnam, but he had been in a plane going over the attack. He went to bed knowing there was no attack. They woke him up and said, we're attacking North Vietnam. He said, what for? They said, because of the attack last night. He said there was no attack. That's in his book. But he kept silent. They told him he had to keep silent. All the people up the chain of command. The admirals, the lower, lower officials. I went and interviewed, interviewed Captain Herrick, uh, who was on the Maddox that, that day. He knew it. But until these documents came out, and I remember uh, Tom Johnson, a great publisher of the LA Times, terrific guy, had been in the White House. So had Bill Moyers. I went down to Tom Johnson's office at the LA Times. And I said, Tom, I got these documents here, and you're not going to like it. And, and Tom Johnson read the documents. And he said, you know, wow. He said, I was lied to. And you have to publish. You have to publish this. Uh, but even on that level, people working in the White House were lied to. And there were no whistleblowers. Where were they? Where were the people not being good Germans? OK? And then I want to give one last example. Uh, because everybody says, well, we have national security. Let me tell you the way journalism works. When the government wants to make its case, honest or not, They'll leak anything, anything, the weapons of mass destruction, this, that. They leak all the time. 95% of what is called news out of the government is leaked. Background sources, it's a total double standard. They only get agitated when something uncomfortable is leaked, okay? And I just want to give, uh, give an example. I mean, one example that drives me crazy was the case of Wen Ho Lee, a scientist at Los Alamos. And government on very high level leaked fraudulent information saying this guy had been involved in the biggest secrecy leaks in American history and blah, 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 blah. And finally a Reagan appointed judge down here in New Mexico said this government owes you an apology and when he cut him loose because they had lied, lied, lied. And yet the media bought it, the New York Times bought it, everyone bought it. And that was really high secret. I'll just give you my own personal example. 
Uh, I was on an airplane, I think it was PSA, it was 1985. Was it PSA or was it Southwest? I don't know. Okay, so I was going up to San Jose. I was a fellow in arms control at Stanford. Condoleezza Rice was in the group. Uh, nice Sid Drell, a great scientist, was ahead of it, and he was one of the Jasons that could see the most secret data. And I get on the plane, and as I'm getting off the plane, San Jose, I run into Edward Teller. The younger people should know he was the father of the H-bomb and so forth. So, and Edward Teller, somebody I had interviewed and actually got along with personally and so forth, and Edward Teller said, oh, where are you going? I said, oh, I'm going up to Stanford Arms Control. I'm going to see Sid Drill. He says, oh, he said, make sure Sid tells you of the great results we got on the cottage test. We got lasing. And this is about the X-ray laser. Could you have a nuclear explosion, get these X-ray lasers, Buck Roger, weapons, Star Wars, kill everything in there? And it was the biggest secret the United States had. The biggest. In terms of the arms race, in terms of international relations, if we had actually able to accomplish that and had the ultimate weapon, there wasn't anything more important to know. And he tells me this, getting off an airplane. <laughs> Why? Because Ed Teller was always on the side of the government. He leaked all the time. He told you what everyone, he wanted to support this program. And so he just told me this. Well, I get up to Stanford, Galva's house, and walked in, hey, Sid, how are you? And great, and I said, I just ran into Edward Teller down at the airport. He tells me, you're supposed to tell me, because he had the clearance, if it's adjacent, you're supposed to tell me the great results they got. And I was working for the LA Times. You're supposed to tell me the great results they just got on the cottage test. He turned white. Said Drell, you know, I turn white, says, what are you talking about? Outside. And we're going to walk outside. What are you talking about? You know, this is the most secret. You can go to jail. This is, what is he, what is Teller? He's lost his mind. You know, and, and, and Drell was furious. Well, it turns out that the information leaked, which was supposed to be so positive, was fraudulent. They thought it was true. The instruments had been distorted by the test. They didn't get the lazing. But we didn't learn about that for a whole nother year. And then finally, the Congressional Budget Office investigated only because there were these stories like I was writing, so forth. Again, no one in the chain of command, first of all, objected when Teller told you those stories, and no one told us the truth. They all went along like good Germans. That is the real issue here. And now we've had some startling exceptions, and Daniel Ellsberg is absolutely right when he, said, when he supports Manning and he supports Snowden. These are the people that save our country. These are the people that we should count on and not vilify. Uh, we should be proud of them. And I just want to end on, well, I just want to tell you something. Uh, uh, I, I have a friend, Barbara Frank, grew up in Modesto, and uh, she was one of my Republican friends. She no longer is a Republican. Uh, I mean, not because of me, I think because of the Republicans, I don't want to, and, and I don't want to endanger your IRS status or anything. Uh, <laughs> some of my best friends are Republicans. Anyway, but uh, I remember Barbara Frank once telling me what her mother in Modesto told her. She said, don't do anything that you don't want to read about on the front page of the Modesto Bee. <laughs> well, that's my advice to the government. If you're ashamed of it, if you don't want us to know about it, don't do it. Don't bug our phones. Don't check our mail. And if you think you have to do it, do it openly with transparency and tell us why you're doing it and let our representatives vote on it. That's the argument here. You know? And the reality is they're upset. Why are they upset with Manning? Because Manning told us our pilots, our gunners, did something horrible. Well, Maybe that's what happens in war. Maybe we should know about that. Maybe we should know the other side. Why did they kill reporters? Why did they kill children? If that's part of war, you know, maybe we should know about it, debate it, consider it, consider it what it does to our own people to engage in these policies. The real issue here, and don't let anyone fool you, is the quality of the information. It's not the leaking. Leaking is the norm. All those pundits on the radio television, they were honest, they would tell you. They expect to be leaked to all the time. All the time. But the leaking is selective. It supports an argument that the government is trying to make, and it's comfortable to them. 
And when you have that rare person like Manning, Ellsberg, Snowden come along and tell you something the government doesn't want you to hear, then all hell breaks loose. And I defy you to show me anything that has come out of the WikiLeaks stuff or most recently the NSA thing uh, that actually endangers our security. Show me anything. I think it strengthens us, our security. And let me ask you one final question. Why isn't there more focus on Booz Allen Hamilton and the Carlyle Company that owns it? You know, I, I remember when Michael Moore's movie came out and he had all these connections between President, the first President Bush and the Carlyle Company and all these lists of people. I thought, oh, come on, Michael, you're getting a little wild. Well, he turned out to be right. Come on, let's have a round of applause for Michael Moore, for God's sake. You know, uh, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm an old fogey who actually believes the game can't be that rigged. But can you imagine? They just recently signed another $6 billion with this company that they already had uh, tens of uh, billions of dollars before. And that's the company that, first of all, they get to be the guardian of our secrets. They get to define who's sec They're the ones who pick Snowden. They can grant national security. The security clearance that you don't have, you can't see this information. The defense contractors, they can give it out. Right? 1.4 million people have those securities. Booz Allen can make you, qualify you, as they did Snowden. Hey, you can go read this stuff. The rest of you can't. You can't handle it. But our guy can. And they're in the business of defining the threat and they're in the business of administering the solutions. I mean, it's what Eisenhower warned about specifically, clearly. This is the new information industrial complex. Okay? They don't, any, you know, they make drones now. You know, they're going to get out of the manned bomber fleet. But it's a truly chilling situation for this country when given the power of the new technology, the fact is, you can now, you know, it used to be you'd be spied on, everyone spied. This is, I said this on our show, and people thought I was being a bit crude, this is a, a wet dream for a Hitler or Stalin. <laughs> you know, I, I worked in the old Soviet Union. I've been in totalitarian countries. You had people following you. Uh, quite often you could count on their being incompetent or being so brutal they were exposed. Or you knew. No one I ever met in the old Soviet Union ever thought Pravda told you the truth, which was its name. They just assumed it lied to you. People were aware of this presence of the police. They knew they were being watched. You know, We have a very different situation. We have the Big Brother situation. We have the 1984 situation, where our people willingly go along with this. Why? Because the one freedom they really respect is the freedom to shop. You know, consumer sovereignty. And all other freedoms, they're cast aside. Sure, I agree, I agree, I agree. Use my location, find this, find this, find this. Okay? So we as a people have gone along with this. And not only that, we now have, as you people probably all work in the computer, as some of you know, we have all these networks of supercomputers and everything. So we can do uh, biometrics and find facial characteristics or something in your eye uh, of 20 million people in 20 minutes. We have the ability, these files no longer just stay in dusty corridors. We have the ability to sift, to make profiles, to do all this sort of stuff. We have the ability to have a sa surveillance state never before imagined. And the idea that you can develop this surveillance state and not question it, not challenge it, not know what it's all about, to my mind, is an obituary for democracy. Absolute obituary. And so I say in the spirit of this building, uh, and I use God in a very broad way, uh, hopefully there are some forces in this universe that are uh, enlightened. It's not a God of the extreme right wing. Uh, but I do say God bless the whistleblowers. I do think they are the saving grace of American democracy. Without them, we are totally lost. And I think in a society where selling out is the norm, to have a guy, people I know, people say, wow, the guy was making 200000 he's living in Hawaii, he's got a stripper girlfriend, or pole dancing, what's he complaining about? You know, what's he complaining about? You hear that argument. 
And you hear it from people who think 200,000 is chump change. Pundits who can get that from an industry lecture conference. And I think we should recognize what we have at stake here is that there are some brave souls that think freedom is non-negotiable. It defines their soul, their essence, their commitment, their moral core, and they're going to be true to it, and we should back them. Bob, I have a, a very difficult question to ask you. Just last week, I ran across an article written by the Associate Director of the Center for Constitutional Rights that puts together all the details of the surveillance that is going on around us. We hear bits and pieces of it. You've mentioned some of it here and there and the other. And in a very persuasive, totally um, authentic way, it is absolutely mind-boggling how much lack of freedom we have in terms of our privacy and the surveillance that's around us. My question, what do we do about that? No, wait, that's not funny. No, I understand. Uh, and you're saying, yes, you support the whistleblowers, yes. But we are in a terrible, terrible place in terms of our freedoms and the democratic process in this country, and we have no idea about it. Well, I think I understand your concern. My feel, first of all, let me say, be positive here. I think Americans love their freedom. And I think uh, in our gut, we know this is wrong. We may not tell a pollster that this week, but I think this uh, last episode with the NSA and our internet data, our telephone, it's stuck with people. It is stuck with people. And I think uh, it, it's brought, a, you know, the, the, the cruise ship has shifted course. Uh, I think we're aware of it. I wrote an article for Yahoo Internet Life before 9-11 year before, I was the head of the privacy project at USC Annenberg School. And we did a cover for Yahoo Internet Life, had a print publication, and I outlined what was happening then. And we got no response. And now it's you know thousands of times worse. Uh, but I think people are waking up, and I think they have to be educated to something uh, very important, which is why is privacy significant? And the founders understood that, not the word, but the spirit of privacy when in the Fourth Amendment. And people should look at the Fourth Amendment because it, what does it say? It says that you need some place that the king cannot get to. You need some place to experiment in your thinking. You need some place to be alone with your thoughts, uh, to challenge, to question. And, and to develop your own, you know, society is based on a notion of individualism. Develop self. Uh, develop some sense of personal accountability. And then when you've got it together, yes, we have the protection of speech, assembly, and you can act on it. It's a, it's a critical notion uh, of, of that personal space being essential to the formation of a free citizen. And we've lost that. We've accepted that mass culture, mass society, conformity, uh, shopping, uh, trend lines, all of this stuff, and that's the enemy of this notion of individual freedom and liberty that the founders uh, enshrined. And I think we can win this debate. I think when people realize what is done in their name, what rights they've... Oh, let me give you one positive thing. If you want to leave this all... We had a chance when we did the Financial Services Modernization Act that destroyed Glass-Steagall, something my last book was all about. Ed Markey, uh, William Sapphire, a conservative columnist, 
New York Times, uh, Shelby, a conservative Republican senator, all agreed that they should build in privacy protection in that legislation because we were allowing the banks, the insurance companies to merge investment houses and they have this enormous amount of data about your health, your life, everything else. And the principle is, keep it in mind, the difference between opt-in and opt-out. And they were saying, you, can only, you should only be able to share this information if you have the person's, the individual's specific permission to share it. That's opt-in. Opt-out means you have to take the initiative. I know you're doing this. I don't want you to do it. And we were failed by our political class. We were failed by our commentators. They did not rise to the occasion. And I think right now, that's one we could win. That no one has the right to take your personal data and put it into a market and then turn it over to government and so forth without your permission. That should be the bedrock principle. Just because you bought that book doesn't mean you want other people to know you bought that book or attended that movie. So I'm hoping that we get sophisticated about this. People will realize what has been lost. And by the way, this is not a national problem. It's an international problem. So we're going to get pressure from all over the world to do this. How do we build a movement around this? Well, as the prodigal son, uh, no, I... I uh, I don't know why people ask me that question. I am lousy at building movements. Uh, you know, I, All Saints, All Saints Church, George Regas, and the people here, the, all, all the, the families that have been involved from the beginning with this church, they're great at building movements. Uh, I'm not an expert on that. It's not my job. Uh, my part in this thing as a journalist uh, is to alert people to what I think is a danger. Your job is to get your neighbors to be concerned. Do you think that here? Legislators to, to pass that yeah. Well, yes. My wife, who's much better at this than I am, <laughs> says we should organize to get legislators to pass a law supporting opt-in rather than opt-out. I think that should be your basic right. Uh, but what I mean is, you, you know what I mean. You have, you, you've got, look, Diane Feinstein, for God's sake, has played a terrible role in this. Terrible role. Well, you, she's your senator. Don't tell me she's the lesser evil. You know, don't tell me it's acceptable or you'll get something worse. You should at the very least be telling that woman she's failed you. And what does she mean without any trial or anything? This guy's guilty of, of treason? And, and Dick Cheney wasn't? <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, the, the people who lie us into war and get a Ron Kovic paralyzed for life, or a Jessica Lynch injured for life, where all the people have died, they're not traitors? And you're going to go after Bradley Manning? I mean, think about it. Uh, and that's what Diane Feinstein said. That's what many of our Democrats and Republicans say. Uh, so I would say the first thing is to care about this. This is the ball game. Um, how do we get people to care? I mean, I'm an educator, and yeah. I'm seeing a lot of apathy from the young. I mean, I'm looking around the room, and I don't see too many, you know, of the younger, like, 20 generation participating. And that's, I think, like, the biggest issue that I have, trying to go ahead and get them motivated. On top of that, you know, you have this fear of uh, seeing, you know, the climate of things. It's when you're an educator and you're talking about these things that are viewed as, uh, what should I say, you know, Again, um, you know, subversive, thank you, yeah, subversive, you know, it's like your career is basically jeopardized. Uh, I, look, I'm not going to minimize the problem. I, 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 I'm very optimistic because I'm a pretty old guy now. And I, um, a doctor once, I asked the doctor once, am I I'm being stupid working six jobs and running around? What am I doing at this church on Sunday? I should be out, you know, fishing or something. I got to, you know, and, and he said... He asked me, he said, ask yourself one question. Are you hitting the accelerator and the brake at the same time? It's, you know. Uh, <clears throat> and, and I thought to myself, uh, no, I'm getting some positive traction. So I could sit here and be demoralized. Why am I talking about Vietnam all these years later when I failed so miserably, right? Or I could say, no, we helped educate the country and move it along. 
and, and we did it with Iraq, and now people are less inclined to go. So, you know, and, and my feeling, I'm much more optimistic about the students that I deal with. I think the internet is a great asset if it's not shut down, if it's not paralyzed, uh, because people can, you know, here, they, for instance, I'm speaking, right? Anyone in this room can say, ah, she is full of it. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He mentioned George Washington, he mentioned this, he mentioned a Teller, but you know what? You get home or you don't even get home. You get it on your phone outside and you say, hey, was she full of it, right? What was that about the cottage test? Or what is this about, the, you know, so, so, so. And people get up to speed really fast now. They don't have to abandon their jobs. They don't have to, you know, go to the 42nd Street Library in New York and for, for hours and hours. So we have weapons <laughs> on the side of truth. And I want to just say positively, and speaking of this church, one reason I'm perfectly willing to refer to Jesus and, and invoke some of our re religious heritage because I think that's the place where we've discussed ethics. I think that's where we have many people who cared about it. And I think of somebody like Chris Hedges. Uh, I've learned a great deal uh, about this religion uh, from Chris Hedges. And he channels his father, who was a minister, and who got pushed out because he supported gay rights, he supported civil rights, and he got pushed out of his church. But if I look at what Chris Hedges is able to do as our moral conscience, I think he's the most valuable journalist we have. Uh, and uh, he, we publish him in the New York Times. He had been their bureau chief. But I got this truth dig now that I'm doing with my partner, Ray Kaufman, and, and, and we reach, we put Chris Hedges in, and he's got something interesting to say. We can reach millions of people. We share it with other sites. It goes all over the world. He's incredibly popular. And he can make, we, he did an interview with Julian Assange that we shared with publications all over the world. So there are opportunities. And the thing I don't like about your question, I respect what you're saying. I know how difficult it is to teach. But if we get pessimistic, it becomes an excuse for passivity. You know, it becomes an excuse uh, for inaction. And, and I think this church has set a model of accomplishment. If I think of all the years that I've been coming here, you know, uh, and I think of all the issues this church has been involved with, the conscious raising, and, you know, raising issues, I think it's an incredible record. And it's a, a, a very positive model of, of being able to make a difference. So I want to end on that note. If, Thank uh, you. Yeah.